Some time ago, I needed to oxidise a primary alcohol to an aldehyde, and I made a comprehensive review of the many, many techniques that are available for doing so. During that review, I weighed up the relative advantages and disadvantages of various methods, which I'll quickly summarise on the screen. Initially, I tried a couple of DMSO-based methods that were apparently more practical and amateur accessible than Swin, but despite my exhaustive effort, I couldn't get either of them to yield more than the trace of product. In the end, I decided to use pyridinium chlorochromate because it offered the best balance of practicality, affordability and easily homebrewable reagents, and I obtained the necessary starting materials, pyridinium chromium trioxide, already had hydrochloric acid. I may get cancer from exposure to chromium trioxide and its derivatives, but if I do, I can rest easy knowing that I didn't pay through the notes for that privilege. The PCC method was first reported by Corian Suggs in 1975, that's J. William Suggs, not the fellow from Madness, and the method shown here incorporates key elements of a 1999 refinement by Luzio and colleagues that, that allows the product to be isolated and purified more easily. Their procedure was designed for ketones, but the one I'll be demonstrating produces an aldehyde, so it also incorporates elements from a 1979 paper by Brown, Rao and Kulkani that investigate the reaction in more detail using N-octanol as a starting material. But before I get stuck in, I'll first cover the actual preparation of PCC, a substance that's expensive and hard to find for amateurs, yet easy to homebrew if you have the right materials. This method was described by Agarwal, Tiwari and Sharma in 1990. Not only is it safer than Corey's original method, which forms highly toxic and corrosive chromo chloride as a bride product, but it also gives consistently high yields. The reagents used were deionized water, that's 10 grams, 37% hydrochloric acid, 9.9 grams, pyridine, 8.7 grams, and chromium trioxide, which is 10 grams. 37% hydrochloric acid was diluted to half its original strength using water, cooled to fridge temperature, placed in an ice bath, then pyridine was added to it slowly and carefully using a dropping funnel. The reaction between the two is very exothermic, and if it's carried out at ambient temperature, some smoke can be seen, which is the hydrochloric acid boiling off. The resultant solution of pyridinium chloride was warm to ambient temperature. Chromium trioxide was weighed into a beaker, and the pyridinium chloride solution was added to it with vigorous stirring. Visual evidence of the reaction was very clear, as the dark red lumps of starting material turned into the bright orange product. What you're seeing here is a sped up version of the entire edition in real time. Also, the consistency and the vibrant colour of the mixture made it look like a super concentrated and particularly harmful type of tomato soup. Once it was uniform, the mixture was placed in the fridge overnight and the product was recovered on the pump. The residues were washed out with a small amount of water. The last traces of water were mostly removed by repeatedly compressing it between two layers of filter paper, as per Agarwal, Tuari and Sharma. At this point it's worth noting that in previous attempts I tried to dry the mixture by boiling it dry or by vacuum distillation of water. In doing so I found out the hard way that PCC is not thermally stable. When I tried to dry the product by heating it to 125 degrees at atmospheric pressure, the entire batch was destroyed, leaving only wet brown sludge that was mostly chromium trioxide and water. The latter method failed to remove water due to the heat causing partial decomposition to chromium trioxide, which is very hydroscopic. Anyway, the final yield was 17.65 grams of slightly damp, fine, bright orange powder, representing a yield of 82% with respect to chromium trioxide. Now, onto the procedure itself. The substance oxidised was cinnamyl alcohol because the end product, cinnamaldehyde, smells substantially different to the starting material and at lab temperature it's a yellow liquid as opposed to an off-white solid. Both these features make the product easy to identify and if you're going to use a carcinogenic reagent you might as well use it to make something that smells good. The reagents used were cinnamyl alcohol, that's 1.34 grams, pyridinium chlorochromate, 2.59 grams, the assault I made earlier, Glacial acetic acid, it's one drop, which is about 0.03 grams. Dichloromethane, 40 mils. Diisopropyl ether, it's 40 mils. Uh, silica gel, it's 2.59 grams. That's the gardening grade sand type, not the big beads. Diatomaceous earth, which is also gardening grade, and calcium chloride. PCC and silica gel were weighed into a round bottom flask and suspended in 30 mils of the dichloromethane with stirring. The rest of the DCM was used to dissolve cinnamyl alcohol and acetic acid in a separate beaker. The solution of cinnamyl alcohol was added to the suspension, which almost immediately turned dark brown. As per Brown, Rao and Kulkani, the mixture was then refluxed for one and a half hours. 
When it cooled to ambient temperature, it was diluted with diisopropyl ether, which crashes out the undesired byproducts, and the mixture was filtered by vacuum through diatomaceous earth and silica gel, as per Luzio. The vacuum was applied in short bursts, as both solvents readily evaporate under vacuum at room temperature. The filtrate, which had a noticeable smell of cinnamon and marzipan in addition to the solvents, was dried with anhydrous calcium chloride, then filtered by gravity into a round bottom flask, and the solvent was removed, first by distillation, then when it had cooled to room temperature by vacuum. Cinnamon aldehyde was recovered as 0.48 grams of yellow oil, which is 36% with respect to cinnamon alcohol. Its identity was confirmed by a nasal comparison with a known standard. I should probably have purified it by distillation, but the amount recovered was far too small for my apparatus to handle, and in any case I only made it to test whether or not the method actually works. The yield's pretty poor compared to those generally obtained in this procedure. The conversion from starting material to product appears to be mostly if not entirely complete, but a lot of the actual material seems to have been lost somewhere along the way. One potential reason is that a lot of the product ended up trapped in the filtration step. Corey's original method doesn't involve using absorbent material, instead of using repeated ether washings to extract the product from the mass of semi-solid material that forms during the reaction, and the only filtration is at the very end. Another potential reason is that there was a competing rearrangement or fragmentation reaction involving the charged intermediate that resulted in products unlike either the starting material or the products being formed. Some potential evidence of the latter is that every time I perform this reaction, when I reach the final stage of solvent removal, the DCM came across as a turbid mixture and the ether formed a clear layer on top of it. This mixture became uniform when shaken. Now that I've covered the practical aspects of this method, I'll move on to the philosophical aspects, also known as the lessons I learned from not reading the paper carefully enough. Initially, I had some grief trying to reproduce this method exactly as written, in that the reaction produced a lot of unreacted starting material as well as the intended product, before I noticed a key detail I'd missed before. Luzio and colleagues' original paper is about oxidising secondary alcohols to ketones, and I was trying to turn a primary alcohol into an aldehyde. Cross-referencing other papers, I found that PCC oxidation of primary alcohols requires higher temperatures and longer reaction times than those of secondary alcohols. Given that primary alcohols are more reactive than secondary alcohols, and a lilac primary alcohols like cinnamal alcohol are more reactive still, this seems counterintuitive, but would make sense if the reactions of primary alcohols had a faster corresponding reverse reaction than those of the secondary alcohols, needing more time and heat to drive them to completion. But overall, this is a proven and reliable method, albeit far from universal. Or to put it more simply, it works, but couldn't achieve its typical yields using this particular alcohol. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching.